I'm Christopher Chauncey Watson, Global Marketing Director for Gilead Sciences. Welcome to Zero Hour, a global podcast brought to you by Gilead Sciences. In this podcast, we'll speak with leading culture and health experts to understand the barriers that keep global populations from transformative and meaningful care. We'll shed light on inequity. We'll celebrate innovation. And together, we'll imagine a world with zero barriers, zero disparities, zero new infections, and zero people left behind. It's possible, but there is zero time to wait. When you think of bias, what do you think of? Perhaps a person treated differently because of the color of their skin? Or the pay gap between men and women? A faith minority who experiences bias in a small conservative town? Imagine facing the stigma of HIV as a pregnant woman struggling to protect her child. Or imagine you're an influencer in the public eye and someone accuses you of fueling HIV stigma. How would you react? And how would you then grapple with your HIV diagnosis a short while later? These aren't fantasy scenarios. These are real experiences lived by our guests on today's show. We don't have to imagine how HIV stigma and biases would change our world because it's already happening here and now. I'm David Malbranche, and with me is my co-host, Christopher Chauncey Watson. All right, so let's get right into this episode, Confronting Bias. In this conversation, we're exploring the seen and unseen biases that have a profound impact on people living with and affected by HIV. And our two guests today are exactly the right people to talk about how we can overcome seemingly insurmountable barriers while helping others find and use their voice to do the same. They are role models who are loud and proud about living with HIV. Angelina Namiba is a founder and member of Forum Network which is a peer mentoring program working with mentor mothers and is a UK-based nonprofit focused on women living with HIV. Justin James, also known as the King of Reads, is known for his social media commentary and providing a black perspective on cultural issues, including sex and HIV. Angelina, let's start with you. It's great to have you here with us and thank you for coming. Tell us about your story and why it's important to be a global advocate for women and mothers living with HIV. Thank you, Chancy. So uh, one of the things that actually gave me the inspiration to be involved in that area is my very own diagnosis. So I was diagnosed in 1993. We're talking about some 30 years ago now. This was a time where we didn't have the fantastic treatment that we have now to treat HIV. It was a time where many people living with HIV were dying in droves. But what really helped me to cope back then was I had access to peer support whereby I was supported by other women living with HIV. So it's really important to have the peer support because we have fantastic clinicians who do excellent work in you know, dealing with our clinical needs, but you cannot put a value on, on peer support because we provide the psychosocial support which then complements clinical care. And thank you for bringing in this conversation around it takes more than a pill. But what stigma can you really share in this space that you've been able to either pull out from the work you're doing with the peer support or even that you may have experienced yourself that is surrounding just sharing your status? Yeah, so some of the stigma and the way it impacts particularly so someone like myself or some of the women that I've actually met across the years is the very one about, you know, the blame, the shame. I feel it's important to be able to stand out and speak out to challenge that stigma because part of it is around people thinking that maybe women living with HIV look very different from the rest of society, but we don't. And so it's important that we can speak out. But I'm acutely aware of the fact that many other women out there are emotionally, economically dependent on their partners or significant others. And so they cannot be open about their status. And that's, how, that's just how much it can actually impact on, on people. So, for instance, I'm here and I'm speaking very publicly about living with HIV. But I haven't always done this. It's been a journey for me, but that's because I've had support behind me. So I know, you know, if anything happens, I can call on my friends and my peers and talk it through. And I know we always talk about stigma. And I think we have a role in terms of what we can do as people living with HIV. And that's why I'm here. 
is uh, those of us who can, I believe it's important that we're open about our status just to show the world that actually we are not different than anybody else. You know, when women ask me, so why are you able to be open about your status? I always say to them, if you're thinking about being open about your status and you think that somebody's going to be negative about it, you need to ask yourself a couple of questions. This person I'm telling, uh, do they pay your rent? Mm. Do mm. they feed you? Do they educate your children? And if the answer is no, then you don't really need them in your life. Yeah. But I'm aware that I can say that because I have somewhere to live and if I don't have food, I can call my friend. Yeah. So it's about being able to do it safely. When we speak about support, let's talk about a major support that you've talked about, which is your daughter. So my daughter, you know, she's been absolutely amazing. I'm going to give her a mention if that's all right. Please, you know? please, <laughs> please. <laughs> like, mom, what are you doing? <laughs> her name is Hamza. She's a singer-songwriter. And um, I told her about my status. She's not living with HIV herself. Mm -hmm. But I told her about my status when she was about nine years old, which I think is one of the best decisions I ever made because she's very okay with me about it and I gave her the information and support that she needed. And I find that that's been really good because then I can be myself around her. Uh, she can be herself. And so a friend of mine, his name is Dad, he won't mind me mentioning him, is an activist. He rang me up and he said, well, I've got a journalist friend of mine on standby who wants to interview different immigrants in the UK living with HIV. Mm to actually show the real picture of what people living with HIV look like or immigrants living with HIV look like. And I said, yes, I'll do it. And then I remembered, oh, my daughter is 16 and she's away at boarding school. So I said, let me call her and ask her. And I said, this is what's happening. Can I do the interview? And she said, oh, mom, just do it. Mm. And I'm like, but you know, he wants a picture to go with it and it's going to be online. And she's like, mom, do it. Somebody's got to do it. I'm like, but your friends might see it. And she said, mom, all my friends know you have HIV. Mm. And I said, how do they know that? I said, oh, I told them. I said, what did you do that for? <laughs> I said, she said, because my, your, my friends come home, you know, you do their hair, you cook for them. If they don't like being around us and mm. you living with HIV, then mm. I don't want them in my life. So I went ahead and did the interview. How amazing. How amazing is that? And I think it, it, what it speaks to me is kind of the open communication and how important it is to invite people in, especially close family members, to your diagnosis. We've talked about, we talk about coming out a lot of times with sexual orientation, gender identity, but it's really important with HIV to let somebody in to who you are and all these intersections of your identities as a mother, as an entrepreneur, a speaker, all those things make up part of you and HIV is just a small part of that. What would you say over that course of time for the 30 years, what are the one or two things that you've seen change the most over the 30 years in HIV treatment? For me, it's uh, the number of pills that people have to take, the, the fact that there's less side effects now, it's just the convenience and the choice, the fact that there's so much more choice. So if something doesn't work, particularly when in a place where you have the opportunity to change, you can actually change if you have a good relationship with your clinician. Justin, the king is in the <laughs> building. Talk to us before really, you were this public personality before addressing HIV. And so just what gave you the King of Reeds? Why did you get that title? Um, well, it's, it's been a journey, child. It's been a journey. <laughs> um, but I've always been very vocal, been known as a comedian and stuff in high school. So someone said, hey, like, you need to do some YouTube videos. And I did. I just would complain. I love to complain. It's fun. Um, and... In some conversations and things, I would talk about stuff. Um, just random things I had mentioned and made a comment that was stigmatizing to people living with HIV. And a friend who does a lot of work, his name is Stevie. He messaged me. He was like, "Hey, like I saw, like I was watching your video and I saw you made that comment. And I just think, as a person who has a following like you, you need to be careful of like how you engage in conversations." So I started doing work endless learning and um, he started to provide me a lot of information. So over time, like before my even my diagnosis, I was like understanding of like HIV and sexual health all across the board. And I started to talk about it more in videos, not just a video that was titled HIV this or this. It was just random conversations about something that's happening and I would mention it. So when I got my diagnosis, it was like, it was a shock. I know that I'm probably going to have to say like this publicly because I've been out loud about everything else. I'm queer, so I'm going to have to share this eventually. And um, I was able to do that through the support and the friends and stuff who was like, you're going to like get pushback, 
but it is needed and just realize that once you do it, you're not going to be able to take it back. So you're going to have to deal with all the stigma and all the things that people are going to say. So I was like, okay, girl, I'm, I am the king of Reed, So what's the tea? So someone who's very vocal and loud like me, also living with HIV when I should be silent, I should be quiet, I should not be causing so much attention because now I should be sh- in, like living in shame. I was like, no, I'm going to still be the same person and then I'll show y'all that I am the king of reeds. Think back to the day that you were diagnosed and talk to me about who was the first person and why you told. The first person I um, called was my brother who is no longer alive. Um, and I told him because he was, he's queer as well. And I was like, I just want you to like take care of yourself. Because at, at that point I felt like that I had failed. I felt like even with the knowledge I had, I was like, like now this me and my like a statistic, all of these things. And I was like, I feel like I've not done good. Um, but that was the first person. And then later on I told my mother and the conversation with my mother was kind of what I expected. Like I had to come out to her like, for being queer, and now I have to tell her that I'm HIV positive. I love her, we've had conversations, she's had to do the work with me, um, and she's open to doing the work, but at that time she was like, I thought you were taking care of yourself. And I was like, I didn't know how to answer that. I was like, but I was taking care of myself, I got tested. Not because I had symptoms, not because I was feeling sick, but I went and got tested because it was time to get tested, I knew I was sexually active. So now, like, this is me taking care of myself because it's not important for me to be negative or positive for me to know where my health is at so I can continue taking care of myself. So that time was a lot for me. Um, but my, like, now I'm just so thankful for where I'm at now. I want to just say thank you for sharing that and, and really thank you for saying, bringing in something into this conversation about doing the work. Right. As a psychologist, that is the difficult part. And often it's not just an individual having to do the work, as you both have been talking about. It is the environment around us. You in this infusion of your activism, how did you do the work to bring it to your public platform? Um, Reading and honestly, just listening, because just not uh, when it comes to like HIV and sexual health, but also people with other identities, understanding you know, how people show up, Um, I started to just, you know what, let me just listen. Let me listen to someone. If someone is saying, hey, this is the thing that I'm, like I'm experiencing, da da da, let me just pay attention. And that's when I started to learn and and just move forward. So I think it's important for people to just listen to folks say what they're going through or whatever their experiences are, instead of just like reacting to what they're saying process it because you can learn something from that. And that's what I've been doing with all of, all of the work that I do. It's just being more mindful of the people I'm talking to and listening to them and stop talking over them. And I will say this, it's very brave. Most people have to worry about quote unquote coming out or inviting somebody in either sexuality or HIV status. The fact that you had to do both at the same time, I can't imagine how challenging that was. I want to switch to Angelina and ask, how did bias, what kind of hurdles does stigma and bias present to you and other women living with HIV when it comes to disclosing your status? There is stigma that we experience in society as a whole. And sometimes we can say we can't deal with that, but actually there's also stigma that we experience, the self-stigma. Because if you think about it, before we are diagnosed, most of us will have had only negative things about HIV. So in terms of, if I maybe I focus a bit on the language issue, um, the terms that we use, and these are terms that we've been using for years since HIV came into being. It's not that we use them to stigmatize people, but it's just what we've used. So I'll, can I just give you a few examples? Absolutely. So the first one is disclose. Um, disclosure is a heavy, it's a loaded, it's a legal term. And so, you know, David or Chas, if I came to you and say, I want to disclose something to you, what are you going to think, right? But if I say to you, I want to share something with you, then it kind of makes it a little bit softer and easier, even for me who's going to tell you that thing or share with you, a little bit easier for me to talk about it. I mean, if you think about, you know, people with diagnosed with any other long-term illness, regardless of what it is, the first thing you want to do is go home and share it with your nearest and dearest. But with HIV, you don't want to do it. So disclosure itself is a term that I prefer not to use. So just use talking, telling, or sharing. 
Another term is discordant. You'll hear people saying zero discordant couples, meaning that uh, this is a couple, one living with HIV and one isn't living with HIV. But discordant itself is a negative term. There's absolutely nothing discordant about the couple. It just happens that one is with HIV sta negative status, the other one is HIV positive status. So why not call them a, a magnetic couple? You know, I don't I actually don't know many words that start with this that are good, apart from disco. That's a good word. <laughs> mm -hmm. So another term that, you know, tends to be used a lot is the one of mother to child transmission. That term in itself is places the honors and responsibility on the mother alone. So already she's facing all these other issues and all the stigmas, and then you then call it mother to child transmission. So we, the term we prefer to use is vertical transmission. So just focus on the actual event rather than on the person. Those are perfect examples. And I think what it speaks to, to me at least, is the biomedicalization and the kind of depersonifying of human beings who are living with HIV. And so even when you say the words in the medical community is notorious for this, HIV infected, instead of people living with HIV. And what you'll always hear from people within medical and public health communities, they'll be like, oh, the stigma in the community, the stigma in our churches, the stigma in families, and then they'll say, for people who are HIV infected, and I'll say, well, you know your sentence, you literally just stigmatized persons living with HIV by calling them HIV infected. And they will counter by saying, well, it's a, you know, it is a virus, so it is an infection. I was like, yeah, but it's a person. It's a human first. So we have to start a lot with, you know, human language first. And I think it's an interesting segue to talking about kind of barriers and challenges that you've both experienced in HIV treatment. And I want you to both speak on this, but I wanna uh, ask Justin first, some of the barriers that you've encountered in accessing treatment. It was very challenging for someone who it was, who is like self-employed. Um, I was like, who is gonna cover this medication? Like I, I heard stories about how expensive it is. Um, at the time, I, you know, I was working and I had insurance and they were paying for it, but I was like, that means I have to like always have a job. Like I always have to have access to like healthcare. So when I started working for myself full time, um, I was like, oh my gosh, like who is going to like, what am I, what am I going to do? For a while, um, I did not go see a doctor. Like I was, you know, I was getting, um, it was a program that was paying for the medication, but I was not getting my blood tested. It was interesting. <laughs> to say the least. Angelina, you bring the, the UK perspective. What Justin just described is a very US-centered yes. <laughs> uh, perspective. But in terms of some of the things that act as barriers, and can, if, if it's okay, I'll bring in the voices of some of the women that I've you know, worked with over the years. Um, there's an the issue of many of the women are also caregivers. And so a lot of times they're taking care of everybody else. And so their health comes way back below the priority list. And so they will not seek health care because of that, because they're busy taking care of everybody else. But then some of the women experience, say, intimate partner violence. So them accessing health care depends very much on the partner or the person who actually pays the bills and, you know, feeds them. Um, I think some of the other issues around just not being confident enough to articulate what they need out of healthcare. So you, they may go and see a clinician, you know, and clinician asks, are you okay? But actually they have lots of issues, but they don't feel confident enough because some of them may come from places whereby we don't, for example, where I come from, we don't question people in authority. I'm not going to question if you're my doctor. If you say, take this and do that, I'm just going to do it because that's what we do. So then, And some, and of, some of them feel like, feel like they're like not, they're when, they when they go, go to seek healthcare, healthcare, they may not be believed, believed they, may they may be judged. judged. You know, they may experience discrimination for all sorts of reasons. And so I think it's really important that it's also important to talk about solutions as well, right? Yes. So I have two mnemonics. One is for patients and one is for healthcare providers. The mnemonic for healthcare providers is listen. So L is to really listen, listen to hear to what the patient is saying. I is for insisting on a response. S is for summarizing so that you know that the patient actually understood what you said. The T is about trusting what the patient says and not being judgmental. The E is about encouraging patients to join clinical trials. 
particularly women, because we really do need a lot more women in clinical trials. The end is about exploring new technologies. If the treatment that the patient is taking is not working, then you can give them another option. The mnemonic for patients is about we need to be prepared. So P is about planning what you're going to say at your consultation. The R is about if you have lots of other questions in between the clinic visits, just do a bit of research. The E is about explaining to the doctor about what you're going through. So for instance, if you're experiencing side effects, it's a headache, for example, how, how often do you experience a headache? How long does it last? How much does it affect your quality of life? And then the P is about prioritizing. Many of us see the doctor only every six months, so prioritizing what you really want to make sure that before you leave that consultation, these are the one to three things I need to make sure I've spoken to my doctor about. A is about asking questions. Uh, all the doctors I know love questions, and it's only when you can ask questions that the doctor can respond to you. And then R is about returning, because if you do all those things and they don't work, just go back to the clinic, make another appointment. And E is about exploring other options. Um, if you're not happy with what you've been told or what you've gotten, try something else. Or if you don't feel confident enough to ask for all of those things, then take along a friend or a peer who can help you to articulate what you need. You know, per that, that prepare for me works for any space, right? It's, it's how do we prepare and be empowered. I think it leads for me into this patient empowerment. Justin, so talk a little bit about some of the factors outside of the medical settings that impacted how well you engaged in HIV care. So when I was first diagnosed with HIV, I was asked by my doctor, like, do you think would there ever be a time where you would not take your medication? And I'm thinking, nope, girl, I'm going to take my medication. Like, I'm not worried about that. So fast forward some years when I was going through it, like um, self-employed, and I just didn't have any income as much as I was usually getting. And I had to rely on a service to house me because I had lost housing. And there were nights that I couldn't remember if I was taking my medication or not. And I was just so, like, was struggling, like, in depression and just surviving. Doing all this time, I was like, oh, my gosh, like, I can't remember if, like, I have taken my medication or not. Like, I need to find somewhere to live. So I'm in this trying to survive, like, housing insecurity. I wasn't taking care of my health. I wasn't sure if I was taking my medication. And, I, and at, after the next time I went and had my blood drawn, my um, viral load had went up. I was still undetectable, but it had went up. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, when you get to that point and life happens, whether it's housing insecurity or breakup, loss of a job, the fact that you couldn't even remember whether you took your medication some days or not is very telling. So I think everyone needs to be mindful that Life is happening, and that may influence how people engage in HIV care. We could have the best scientific options. We could have a menu of all kind of bomb-ass medications that people use and can have access to. But if we don't meet with the social conditions and make sure people have the social standing that allows them to access those medications, then we won't ever end this epi epidemic. Yes. I've had, um, and through that story of me experiencing housing insecurity, I also had people share that, you know, they are HIV positive, but they're staying with someone who's abusive. I had people who didn't want to tell the person they were staying with that they were positive because they can lose housing. And like, it's just, it's just so important. It was something I would have never thought about, um, but until I experienced it. So when I started listening to other people in their different stores, like housing is treatment. That is treatment. We have to, you know, we have to meet the people where they are. I, and I just to that point, I think it's a great point to end on, but I, I want to infuse the good Dr. Daryl Wheeler, now president of a college here in the U.S., and he often says, you've got to meet people where they are, where we're capable of meeting them. Justin, tell us about some of your experiences with bias, HIV-related bias in the healthcare system that you've experienced. Speaking about my experience, like I had a nurse, um, just in conversation, just a regular checkup, and she mentioned, um, like, condoms. You said, you know, you know, use condoms. I'm like, no, girl, you equals you. I don't like to use any condoms. I'm not using any condoms. She's like, well, I've just always, you know, like, even if you are a positive and you're undetectable, you still use condoms. I was like, but if there's zero transmission, why do I need to? And for her, it was just like, oh, well, she couldn't. It was almost like she was about to self-destruct. Um, and I can tell that she was like, if you come back and you have anything, that's going to be on you. 
she was being a stern mother and I need her to be my healthcare provider. What does you equals you mean? You want to break that down? Absolutely. Yeah. So you equals you means undetectable, means untransmittable. So if I'm undetectable, I can't transmit HIV to any of my sexual partners. Yeah. And so according to multiple global health organizations, including the World Health Organization and the Department of Health and Human Services, U equals U refers to the concept mm -hmm. that taking HIV medications as prescribed and getting to and staying undetectable for at least six months prevents transmission of HIV to partners through sex. Undetectable means that the virus cannot be measured by a viral load mm -hmm. test, which is a viral load less than 200 copies per milliliter. But you experienced that kind of stigma because when she asked you about condoms, she was saying, you're still using condoms, right? No, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> and then you could feel it. And it wasn't even anything she said verbally. And um, back to what Angelina had said, Angelina, the disclosing thing, I, I've always wondered why I hated that. The connotation like, oh, girl, like, what is, like, am I about to drop some legal stuff? And I'm like, I never wanted to, like, have that conversation. It's just like I'm sharing a part of my life with you, and you should feel honored that I'm sharing. Because in all actuality, um, there are people who do not know that they're positive, and um, they're the ones, a lot of them are the ones passing on HIV, but they do not know they're positive because they're not getting tested. And people are not getting tested because they're fearful of the stigma. Well, the goal is for me to get tested so I can know where I'm at because I would just not come back. And now I'm having, I'm having some other STI long-term that could have been treated. I want some more, I want more protection for people in their sexual health. If she saw me as a person that was highly sexually active or promiscuous or what is the word they use for um, people who are highly um, sexually active, they call them high risk. I was like, she's gonna see me at high, high risk and it's just gonna be, she's just gonna treat me different. And I was like, I came home, I was like, I cannot believe I allowed someone to make me feel so small for something like this. I'm taking care of myself. I was like, I am loud as hell. Any other time, and I felt so insignificant in this moment. And I started to think about how many other people who are not as vocal, not as comfortable coming in, they don't because of that reason. I was like, nope, I did a video about it. I didn't name them, but I was like, you all have to do a better job. I had to turn the comments off, unfortunately, because you know, the stigma was jumping out, but I was like, you're gonna get the message and you're not gonna give me what you think the message should be. And I ended up calling, I ended up having a long conversation with the doctor and I told her, I said, you need to talk to your staff of how they engage in conversations because she was like the moral police with me. Is it the same? Because I think that's an important point that people don't understand. A lot of times in these medical clinics that treat people living with HIV or don't and just have, you know, folks coming in for general sexual health or other concerns, that stigma like that or judging people like that will cause people not to come back at their own detriment because they don't want to go through that judgment and discrimination. Talk to me, you, you, your social king of reads, how has social uh, or discriminatory practices on social just with people living with HIV, how has that changed or have you seen a change? I've seen a change. I think we still have work to, more work to do, but there was a time, um, especially on um, social media, specifically Twitter where I spent a lot of time, I used to see these questions of, would you date someone who was HIV positive? And it would just create so much like negative comments, like, no, never me, I'm not doing any of that. But now in 2023, when someone does that, you have a lot of people who are like in the comments providing research, information. It's like, we've already been, would somebody who's HIV positive even date you? Because when the last time you've been tested? <laughs> so you've seen a positive change? I've seen a positive change, but I think we still have more work to do, but I am, glad to see those conversations like not be as triggering um, and people are jumping up to defend and it's not people who are just positive um, it's people who are negative because what used to happen is the people who would push back on the negative stuff they would be called where well, you must be positive since mm. you're defensive about it they had all this stigma associated to gay black men that this is the way they look and i was like no like girl like no one gave me hiv um that's not my story my story is I was having consensual sex with my sex partners and I contracted it and I, I got tested and I got into treatment. I don't want to feel like I have to dress up the story for you to feel bad for me. Okay, like you had shared earlier, Angeline, when you were saying that when you talk about like disclosing and things, people 
are prepared to like take your story like it's like it's going to be a sad thing all the time because they like it's different. Someone says, "Oh, um, I I have cancer." When I found that was positive, I was like, "I don't even want to tell anybody because I know that I'm not." If I don't come up with a story that supports like me getting empathy, you're not going to want to hear it. Yeah, and you just kind of touched on this a little bit, but how do you think your intersectional identities, how you walk into the room, how does that impact how you experience stigma or bias? Um, All the parts of the wonderful Justin yes. that walk in the room. All the parts. Um, I think all the identities I share, I am um, fat, I am black, I'm dark skin, I am queer, and I'm an HIV positive. And um, I also live in Atlanta. There's this stigma because there's so many black gay men that live in Atlanta that it, has, it must be an epicenter, epicenter for disease and transmission. I'm like, no, they're just getting tested. They're getting tested. I think I'm still like trying to like understand how I show up sometimes. I think that People don't expect me to be positive if they don't to be. So when I show up, they don't want to, you know, oh, well, I wouldn't expect it from you. It's like, it doesn't have a look. It doesn't have a, anything. It's just, it's just people who are having sex. Um, you know, that's one of the ways to contract HIV is through sex. And some of us are having it. Yeah, but it's interesting. And it's almost like a sad commentary <clears throat> that you have to be that cognizant of how you walk into the room and not how you feel about your identities, but worry about the perceptions from other people. Any experience of the turning off because of stigma um, of your intersectionality of a woman, of um, immigrant status, of, of living with HIV from your family or friends? Hmm. For me personally, I think either I've been very lucky or I just don't see it. And probably I don't see it because I choose not to see it. Um, because that's just the attitude I've decided to take. If you don't like me because I have HIV, we can take a walk. But I can do it because, as I said, I've had support for many years. And so if anybody doesn't like it, my daughter's cool about it. My family are fine about it. I have like a whole host of friends. So actually, I can deal with it. But I do know of women who've experienced a lot of it. And, you know, a lot of them lock themselves away or won't even... Have you mentioned the word HIV in front of them? Or they won't even refer to it in terms of themselves. They don't even sometimes, why are you so open about your status? Or they may not even want to associate with you because they may be found out. People will think they are positive by association. So it's just like, so for me personally, I just, I just, re I refuse to take it. I think one of the, the reasons why I kind of don't, accept the stigma that's directed at me is because I'm much more than the virus. I'm Angelina, I'm a friend, I'm a mother. HIV only occupies a very tiny part of me, so it's, it's going to live by my rules in my house. It won't define who I am. Um, I turn it off when I'm turning on the apps. I do not have my status on, um, on, the, on the apps. When I say apps, I'm dating apps um, or hookup apps, whatever they call the apps, to look for other people. And um, there's just so much stigma like when I'm on the apps and I'm seeing like, oh, you know, drug disease free, um, clean, all these like stigmatizing things. And I'm just like, I don't want to be subjected to that because I know that people are not going to be as responsive because I am showing up on this app as a fat, black, dark skinned man. And it's just like another thing is, oh, you're HIV positive too. I'm already subjected to body shaming, anti-fatness and fat phobia. Then it's like, OK, girl, she's OK with me being fat. But is it going to be, or are they going to be interested if I tell them I HIV positive? Thank you for sharing your stories and being so empowering and lifting not only your voices, but the voices of the people you serve and the people that listen to you. This is how we change these conversations, right? I think we all need to listen, right? Listen to each other, listen to the stories, be a little bit more kinder to, to one another. And we all need to prepare, prepare for who we want to be and how we want to show up. Yeah, I can't thank you both enough, both Angelina and Justin. And we're going to wrap this up. Um, talking about how we address the effects of bias in healthcare and HIV is a conversation that needs to happen more widely so that more people begin to understand the impacts of their words and their actions. And I think both of you spoke fairly eloquently about that with mnemonics 
and everything like that. So it's 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 really been a a pleasure to sit and share space with you both as you're telling your stories. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Zero Hour. We've learned so much today about the past and present of HIV, and there's even more to learn if we're going to change the future. Listen on for more global perspectives, more lived experiences, and more expert voices. I'm David Malbranche, and we'll see you at the finish line. Subscribe to Zero Hour wherever you get your podcasts and look for it on YouTube. And for more information, please visit GileadHIVtogether.com. This presentation is protected by U.S. and international copyright laws and owned by Gilead Sciences. The podcast should not be copied, reproduced, or distributed in whole or in part without express permission from Gilead Sciences. The views expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of Gilead Sciences.